Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Call the Damn Leads, the show by sales professionals for sales professionals. I'm your host, Drewby Wilson, with more than two decades in the industry. I've seen it, lived it, heard about it, and now I'm bringing it to you, my favorite people in the world, the sales community, because I know that this is literally the greatest job in the world because it allows us to create a life that we can be proud of in any situation, from any background, and with any future in mind, it is possible if we do the work. And one thing I know is that along the journey, you're going to meet some amazing people, have some crazy ass things happen, and you're going to be able to tell some amazing stories. And that's what this show is all about. And today's guest is someone I'm excited to have on. I've had the pleasure of seeing him kind of via social media wise, but we just got this opportunity to meet in person today, and I'm excited to bring on Ryan, the Prosperity Professor Stone. What's up, brother? What's happening, man? Thank you for having me. I'm stoked to be here. I'm stoked to be talking about this. I am stoked to have you, man. Yeah, you know, sales is an industry filled with a lot of, of ups and downs and wild experiences, and what I would love to know from you, just to jump right into it, man, what is your craziest sales experience of all time? There's, there's a lot to choose from. I mean, honestly, I've been in kind of a bunch of different roles from like all the way down th- since I was a 13 year old, I've had different entrepreneurial pursuits. So it's, it's been kind of wild. Uh, one of the, one of the craziest ones was, uh, when I was 13, I borrowed, my mom was a teacher. So I borrowed this huge camera. This is back in the day. I didn't have cell phone cameras yet. I had this mm-hmm. huge camera and I had a wedding filming service. So I, I would film people's weddings charge him 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, which is a ton to me. I was 13 years old. And at one wedding, uh, I accidentally meandered into uh, a room with a couple people uh, arranging a separate relationship. <laughs> and it was super awkward. Cause here I am 13 years old, busting the door. I'm just trying to find some people to interview because the, uh, the groom asked me to. So I interview the grandpa, the, the uncle, I'm walking around, I steal a couple pieces of crackers and cheese when I can. And then there's this back room uh, that I was trying to find a place to like charge my my separate battery, open the door and uh, they're doing the horizontal monster mash right on a, a countertop. And it was literally one of the most awkward points in my life. But I, I ended up with a huge tip and it wasn't wasn't from that guy. So paid out. And uh, <laughs> it was it was a wild one, though. I mean, as long as it wasn't the groom having a, a separate relationship prior to the wedding, that could have gotten way, way worse. And still, what happens though, if it I, was? I don't know. Like, if it you was, write a song about like, it, do and I you bring, go famous? Like, <laughs> do I bring it up and not get paid, or just do I say, do do I bring it up and get paid more? Uh, that's an interesting scenario there. That you know, that's a great question. If you're listening, tune in on, and comment on this, and let us know like what your response would be in that situation, right? If you walked <laughs> in as a wedding service and and you happen to catch the groom or the 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 bride doing something with someone else that they're not supposed to, what would your response be? That'd be a hell of a story. If you're listening and you have a wedding service and you've also had this experience, go to callthedamleads.com slash podcast and tell us about it because I want to bring you on too because that is. Pretty wild, to be honest with you, Ryan, at 13 years old to have that experience. But what I really loved about that is not just the story, but knowing at 13 years old, you are having this entrepreneurial mindset and you are setting yourself up making 500, 1,000 bucks. You know, over the years, you said you've had quite a few different jobs. Sales is, in my opinion, one of the things that drives the needle in every different opportunity, whether you're actually selling a product or you're recruiting new people. So, you know, with that being said, what would you say is your sales superpower or like your secret weapon when it comes to, you know, creating a sales conversation? Uh, I'm working on it. But I think I think one thing that I'm constantly trying to get better at is really listening and also listening between the lines. I learned this the other day. Here's a good way to put it. You don't build rapport with a prospect by asking about the weather or asking about how his Christmas was. Uh, I've had a couple high ticket calls the day after Christmas. Didn't even bring it up. You build rapport by asking really poignant questions about the real problem that they want to be solved. And when you're asking mm-hmm. better questions than they're even thinking about, that's when you make rapport. That's when they're like, oh, this guy knows some shit that I don't know. I need to get a little bit more juice from him. So one one thing that I'm constantly trying to get at is in, improving my knowledge, increasing my knowledge of the field that I'm in so that I can serve better 
But the pathway to do that is by asking bigger and bigger questions that lead to bigger problems and uh, things you can solve. So that's one thing I, I've strived to. Quick break I had in between entrepreneurial pursuits in high school is I, I followed my mom's footsteps after college and went into teaching. And I was an elementary school teacher for 12 years, uh, mainly in, in uh, West Oakland. So I think I got really good at communicating and, and being able to put exactly what I was intending to say in the right words, because mm. you have to do that with seven year olds. Other, they're already not listening. Um, <laughs> and so you got to get pretty good at like speaking and asking the right questions. I, you know what? That's such a great point. And, and it's one of the five steps of the process I use when I'm teaching sales professionals, right? Is the calls process. And the, and the second point is ask intentional questions. And so many people skip past that in the sales process. They're just kind of like, oh, you're interested in this thing? Let me tell you how fucking great it is. This is awesome. This is all these features and benefits and woo, 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 wah, wah. And it's like, yeah, I don't give a shit about any of the features or the benefits because it doesn't really actually tell me what I need. And what I need is to know that my fucking needs are being met. And if you don't ask questions and you don't truly understand that and you don't listen, like you said, first and foremost, right? Listening intently being the third part of the process that I talk about. It, it's so true. And so many people are, it's not as much the new sales reps that I see do this. It's the guys that get in and they get kind of comfortable and they're like, cool. I already know this guy's problem. I'm going to fix it for him. He's fucking, he don't even know I'm about to fix his Dude, whole ass so world. True. And yeah, that's so true. I'm, I'm on a, a couple high ticket. Well, I'm on one high ticket team for a, for a program. Uh, and I've over the year or so that I've been with them, I've watched a lot of closers come on and we kind of see a pattern because new closers will come on, they'll adopt the process and they'll just, they'll actually get some pretty good wins out the gate. Right. And then mm -hmm. you kind of start getting in your head and fiddling with things and you get off the process or you get overconfident. And, and by process, I'm referring to the right questions asked at the right time in the context. Um, and then all of a sudden there's a slump and then they kind of dry out because they're not sticking to the original questions of the discovery process that helps the client build that internal pressure to fix the shit they came for in the first place. It's, mm -hmm. it's clutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's such a big deal. And I love how you mentioned the idea of like working with seven year olds, because let's be honest, that's kind of how sales is too. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Like no one cares how smart you are unless they know that you care. And it's that same mentality of like, hey, can I trust this person? Do they actually know what the hell they're talking about? And can they bring me something of value that makes sense to me? And that for me is one of my superpowers, I think, is I've really developed the ability to relate things to where someone is. And it's because I've learned, like you said, to ask very intentional questions. And, and some of that rapport building is like, well, tell me about yourself. What what got you into that? How did you get into that industry? What what the fuck? I've never heard of that. Why is that so cool? Like, that is interesting. Tell me more about that and giving them a chance to make them feel heard. And it, it's so cool because it just pops into place. And, and from a teacher perspective, I would love to know how you've been able to, in your roles, take what you've learned about sales and then use your teacher methodology to bring that on new reps. Because I know there's a lot of folks that listen that are like leading a team or they're starting a team of their own. And I'm sure some insight on how to like approach that conversation would be really valuable to them. Yeah, sure. Some of the main patterns I, or, or skills that I rely on from teaching is one is time management, like going from teaching, which is like I'm at the school at 730. I leave at 430. I'm doing math at after recess. Like it's a set schedule. Right. Mm -hmm. And then going to entrepreneurship, like you're your own boss. You got you have to have a rigid schedule the same way and stick to it. You got to have an, an hour or a period of time every day where you call the damn leads and like you just build that into the schedule. You actually do it right. You yep. have a day where you actually do the CRM work and you actually update things. So all your automations are actually doing something that you built it for. So time management is a huge one, a part of that. And I think, I think this is getting into the business world. But one thing I learned in the credential school was, uh, we call them smart E goals, smart goals. Don't, I can't just Google it if you want to figure out what the acronym is, but basically the, the point of a smart goal is to have an actual set time. Uh, an operation around your goals, right? And then E, we said E in schools because I was in California, so we needed an equity as well. Like, how mm. are we going to make our goals equitable to everyone? Which is less and re is re less relevant for for sales, but actually getting solid goals. 
But the thing about goals is if you do not have the right habits to actually build and accomplish the goals, the goals are nothing but like a fluffy dream. So mm. that's where those two things are really interconnected. And I think in teaching, you have to start with the end in mind. You're like, I, by the end of this lesson, I want these kids to be able to add double digit numbers. Okay, cool. What are the building blocks that I need to put in place so that that's a really easy enrollment for them? Okay, cool. If I can reverse engineer that kind of thought process, I can do that in sales too for pretty much any kind of pain point. I absolutely love that. And I, I mean, there's a lot of different styles and strategies of sales. And I think you kind of mentioned this earlier, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can go about it. And there's some people that are very much like the, hey, let's, let's push and let's go hard on the sale. And then there's the other side that's like, well, let's slow it down a little bit. Let's learn. Let's educate. Let's kind of get a feel for where things are. And there's no right or wrong way to go about it. I personally am more of kind of like the laid back, chill, kind of like, I mean, here's what we're going to do. Here's what's going to happen. Either you're going to want it or you're not. And if you do know, like if I do know that it can help you, yeah, I'm going to push a little bit because like it's my duty to help people. And also I like the idea of, you know, time management of like, hey, if this ain't for you, let's not waste each other's time. Let's just get right down to it and no harm, no foul. This ain't the right time. This ain't the right place. That doesn't mean that it's over. It just means that we need to continue carrying this conversation, building the relationship, setting ourselves up for the future. And time management is that. It's like, okay, cool. Let's block this in. We're going to do an hour for calls. We're going to do an hour for CRM management. How did you, did you always have that mentality or was it really like you had to bring that over and, and kind of like parlay it into what you do now? Yeah, it, it was a weird mess because I, I started my original business on the side while I was teaching. So I had to build it in then, but it definitely took a while for me to implement kind of the deeper teaching things. I saw you, I think it was one of either you or another one of Stewie's guys was, uh, made a post about Bloom's taxonomy. Were you guys talking about that? I think uh, Brandon was. It's okay. It might have been Brandon. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's something that we study immensely in uh, curriculum school, kind of like understanding what people actually need. And for me in business, it was that same way. Like first I needed to just get survival mode. Like I just need to learn how to make freaking money and do this again. Uh, <laughs> and then you got to build up. It's like, okay, this is working. How do I duplicate that? How do I automate this piece? I think it's, I think it's something everyone learns over time. Have you noticed with the network that you're in compared to like in the early years when you join, like, ha have you noticed an acceleration of like your learning? Oh, for sure. And what I recognize in myself and, and, you know, in the community for sure is that I'm very much time conscious now. You know, someone hit me with a question early on that was like, hey, man, how would it feel if you knew that you worked as hard as you work and yet you had to sit up in heaven and watch down as some other asshole got to sleep in your bed with your wife and raise your kid in your house with your money because you didn't take the time to take care of yourself? Wow. And I was like, well, fuck you, man. <laughs> Dickhead, yeah. what the fuck does that mean? And But it did. It hit hard, right? And I'm like, okay, well, shit. Like, I know how to make money. I know how to go and do those things. But like, if I'm not being conscious of my time and where I'm investing it, like, it doesn't matter how much money I make. It doesn't matter, like, how great I am, what skill set I have. If I'm not here to utilize it, it's for nothing. And so that to so me good. is really where, like, the time management hit hard because it was like, do you want to spend 12 hours a day in your business or do you want to spend six hours a day in your business and spend six hours with your family? Dude, I, I went through such a, I went through a bit of a shock. At the start of this year, I moved from California to Kentucky. So I moved three time zones. And aside from like all the other differences, a really hard shift for me was changing my schedule from Pacific time to Eastern time because I have multiple different hats that I wear in a couple of different businesses that was perfectly designed on Pacific time. But then I had to go to Eastern, right? So there was this big three hour shift for everything. Mm -hmm. And when I redesigned my schedule, what I did this time was I wrote down everything that I wanted to make sure to get done every single week. And then I prioritized it. And the first thing on that list was me spending time with my wife. We have a, mm -hmm. we have a sick ass boat. It's not the hugest thing. We have a boat. We have, we're at, uh, we live on the lake. I love going out on the lake with my wife. It's my favorite thing to do. So I know if there's anything taking me away from that time, it better be damn important. It better be super important. And so I, I built right. in that time first in my week, wife, wife time. And then I built everything in after that, depending on the procedure. And then you just got to stick to that schedule. 
That's, I mean, that's the key. That is ultimately the key is being intentional and making sure that you're set up and good to go and making that lifestyle what you want. One of the things I see so many entrepreneurs and sales professionals and just people in general doing is they structure everything around like, all right, well, I know I got to work because I got to make money. So I'm going to do that. And then with whatever time is left over, I'm going to give my family, my relationships, whatever. Doesn't and work that way. then no. And then they're themselves are last. And they're like, okay, well, I got no time for me. So I'm getting out of shape. I'm unhealthy. I don't feel good. Like my mind's all fucked up. And so funny enough, the first thing they tell you when you get on an airplane, if there's an emergency, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first, because if you don't, you're a burden to everybody else. And yet so many people run this mentality of like, well, I just fill in the gaps with whatever's left. Okay, well, instead, put your priorities on there first. And it'll be crazy that you'll notice when you do those things, you find the energy to do all the other shit that allows you to keep those priorities top. 100%. The same piece of that is like when you are trying to schedule it out now with you because you're shifting to call the leads like did you do anything different when you kind of like redesigned your life recently like that's because how long were you in the past the other position so i was in the c-suite position for about three years i had been with apex for five so i mean it was a pretty big shift but at the same time when i shifted into building call the damn leads i was already aware it's like okay cool i know what needs to be done So it's just a matter Mm. of prioritizing and going, okay, well, this is the life that I want. And even though I've built a comfortable life, right, multiple six figures and income every year, like kind of had a business rolling, things were good when I shifted and said, okay, cool, I'm walking away from all of that completely to start over. There's certain little sacrifices that have to be made from a time wise. But at the same time, I'm realizing, okay, cool, if it took me five years to build what I built over there with the skill set that I've acquired and developed, how fast can I do it this time? Can I do it in a year and a half? Can I do it in a year? I believe I can, which is why I was willing to walk away from everything that I had built there. Not completely walk away, right? I'm still plugged in. I'm still part of the community, but it was like, okay, cool, I'm going to go all in on this. Yeah, exactly. And so that is, I think, one of the biggest things that terrifies most entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, sales professionals, it's like, I want to go all in, but I don't want to leave that comfort zone. And it's funny because the comfort zone that they're in ain't really comfortable to begin with. And when you set that intention of like, Hey, these are the things that matter. You actually get what you want out of life. Here's, here's the best. Here's a good sales nuance that I am learning is truer than ever. Most of the time, the objection you give is almost always the reason you should do it. Come on. Uh, the, the, the number one objection that they give is almost always the reason that they should do it. And we can, we could test it out. Like you give me all kinds of objections. We can go that route, but just in my story, I was school teacher for uh, 12 years at this point, COVID hits. I had building, I'd started building my business up like on the side, nothing to write home about, but it was nice to get a little extra from a teacher salary, right? Like anything above mm-hmm. that is fantastic. May of 2020, the school that I was working at closed. They lost their charter. They couldn't fund the mortgage. They were closing. That was the that was the end. So I was like, all right, do or die. Do I go sign up for another school or do I like just do this business thing? And I'll never forget this. June of 2020, I made my entire teacher salary in that same in that single month. I made 50 grand in June of 2020. I was like, okay, that's it. (laughs) Not doing that anymore. But I, another awesome. thing I really, I really want to highlight that you said, Drew, is like talking about being really intentional about your time, your finances, your focus, because this is a statistic I heard the other day, like something stupid, like 80, 90% of your thoughts every single day are the same as the ones you had yesterday. So the only real differentiator every single day is that 10%, that weird difference. Your thoughts are exactly the same. You wake up, you reach for your phone or you do your little meditation, or like whatever you've kind of grab your dopamine with first in the morning, like you're going to do that over again. And then you're going to get into the same rhythm, like a little freaking pinball machine, but there's only five to 10% variance. And we have to try and build that muscle in order to create intentionality about where we want to go with our finances. You cannot be in the situation where you're like, I'm going to spend everything. And if I have a little extra, I'll put it in savings or I'll put it in a Roth or I'll put it in investing. Like you have to be intentional with that and live on your means below it because otherwise you're going to be up in heaven watching someone else enjoy what you tried to build every single time. Yeah, it's a true story, and it's one you can't escape, man. Death and taxes only guarantees we have in life. Um, and, and with that being said, the prosperity professor being your brand, being your name, 
if people have questions, they want to know, hey, man, what does that mean? What is it like? How do I create prosperity? How do I get out of my W-2 and go and create a, a, you know, a role where I can make what I made in a year like you did? How can people come and find you and learn about what you have going on? Kind of, you know, see see the process you took. Yeah, we're uh, anywhere, any social media platform, The Prosperity Professor. We do advanced financial planning for people who are dreamers. And what I love to do is help people get some more advanced strategies in place so that their dream actually becomes a reality. And uh, we've worked with real estate investors. We work with teachers. We work with single moms who are just trying to put a a fun business together. And it's, it's an absolutely, it's an honor to do what I do now. So feel free. If you have any questions, if you feel like you're paying too much in tax, if you feel like you don't know where your money's going or don't know what to do with it, I'm happy to be a resource to anybody. I love that. And I know you will, man, because I, I, again, we've had a chance to kind of connect and I've seen the stuff that you're putting out there and the value that you provide to the community. So like truly grateful that you took the time out of your day to be here, to share some of your stories and share some wisdom. Because what I know is at some point along the way, there was one person who took a minute to, to share some value with me, much like I'm sure in your journey, there was someone that was like, hey, man, here's some game. Let me share something with you. And so if you are listening to this today and you got some value First, make sure you go follow my man, Ryan, at The Prosperity Professor all over on social media. I'll put the notes and everything in here in the the show notes. And also, share this with your friends. Put it out there. Tag us on social media, at Call the Damn Leads, at The Prosperity Professor. Let people know that you got value from the show because that's what's truly going to make this community even greater than it already is. Putting more value, giving some stories, And letting people know that you're not alone on this journey and that wherever you are, if you're facing a struggle or a roadblock, there is someone there who can help you build a ramp, move over that thing and take it to that next portion of your life and your adventure. Because, man, it's a journey. It's a marathon. There's a lot more to come. And as you'll find on the journey, there's ups, there's downs. And when you're in a down place, it really helps to have great people like Ryan in your corner to be able to reach out to and have some conversation and just know That's what it's all about. So again, Ryan, thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today, man. I know we could chat all day. With that said, if you're here and you have an amazing sales story, I want you to come on the show and I want to share it. Go to callthedamnleads.com forward slash podcast. Send me your information. Tell me a little bit about your story. Let's set you up to get you on the show and put it out there because here's what I know. Just like my man, Ryan, everyone in sales has a story. Your story could be the catalyst of growth or success for someone on their journey. And that's what this show is all about. So again, Ryan, thank you, brother. We'll see you guys on the next one. Go call the damn leads. 